If you're thinking of doing a 145 big bore kit on your Honda Grom or Monkey, you want to watch this video first. A few months back, we upgraded the 125 Monkey with the Kitako 145 kit, which has got a bigger piston, barrel, and a cam. And to be fair, we've been really impressed with the performance. If you haven't seen that dyno vid, check out our other videos and have a watch. But performance aside, we thought it sounded a little bit rattly from the top end, and there's been a lot of comments on social media and other people saying that they've heard similar noises at medium and high revs, especially under load. It sounded very tappity. We adjusted and readjusted the valve clearances, making sure they were absolutely perfect to the spec. We even managed a short test with them at a much tighter tolerance, one that's more akin to other manufacturers' recommendations, but nothing. Still, this ticking, tapping noise. We wondered if it was the cam chain tensioner and we replaced that. We upgraded to the speed shop tensioner arm, but still just the same. So, there's only one thing for it. We're going to pull it apart and we're going to rebuild it using the Takagawa 145 version and give us a direct comparison. So, in this video, you're going to see us strip the engine down. We're going to have a look at the internals, see how they're holding up. And then we'll rebuild the top end with the Takagawa kit and see if that annoying rattle has gone forever. This also gives us an opportunity to get the bike back down to Dynajet UK and let them create a map for the Takagawa 145 and see how it fares from brake horsepower perspective compared to the 12.1 we got on the Kitako kit. Straight after that, we've got something a bit special. It's just arrived from Waybike. It's the Takagawa 4-valve kit, which is a 145 piston and barrel but it's a high performance cam and a head with twice as many valves. So we'll get that built and dynoed very soon. Anyway, enough going on. Let's get to stripping this bike, inspecting the engine and rebuilding the Honda Monkey. First things first, let's get the bike up in the air. All pan under the sump, bit of tin foil to protect the over racing exhaust. Drop the oil out, and start to remove the all cooler lines in the DNA Stage 3 intake kit. Pop the throttle body cover off with an 8mm socket so we can access the main flange bolts and then with a 10mm socket just remove the two bolts we're using a couple of cable ties to lift it up out of the way. 8mm socket to whip the O2 sensor guard off and unplug the cable then remove the exhaust header pipe that's two 12mm nuts. With that done, you get a good look at the top end of the engine. Onto the other side, we're removing the 8mm bolts from the stator cover and disconnecting the wiring. And with that done, pull the stator cover off and set it aside. Now, if you've got the fourth bearing crankshaft support installed, now is a good time to give that bearing some oil. Then, it's removing the crank sensor guard and unplugging the cable. And we are ready to open up the valves and make it possible to twist the camshaft out. With the valve covers off, we're using the Katako valve adjuster tool. Just makes it easier, but basically you're backing them right off to create space to pull the cam lobes past. Then it's cam gear cover off and all pan out of the way. Loosen the cam gear retaining bolt and just pull the gear off. Then there's a cam retaining bolt to come off too. This allows you to rotate the cam backwards and forwards and while pulling on it, with a bit of encouragement, it'll slide right out. In a quick inspection of ours, it all looks good. Loosen the cam chain roller guide bolt and then it's on to evenly undoing the head stud nuts. When they're loosened, then it's the two head flange bolts. When they're all loosened, take the full tension off and remove them all. Slide the head off and have a quick look. All looks okay, no signs of gasket issues. There's no undue buildup of carbon anywhere. Pull the cam chain guide roller out and the cam chain guide itself. Then we're pulling off the barrel. Make sure the piston doesn't fall out and clatter the casing. It's sensible at this point to put something in the cavities to stop anything unwanted going in. Wrist pin retaining clip out and just push the wrist pin through and detach the piston from the connecting rod. The piston looks good, no unexpected marks or excessive carbon. 
the barrel looks really good, the finish still looks nice and even, and again, no unexpected marks, which is a decent reflection on the Kitako kit mechanically. Right, on to the Takagawa. Let's get it opened up and see what we have. So, with the barrel itself, it seems a very similar weight, and we'll get the weights done in a minute. The piston itself, the cam, and then all the sundries and gaskets, lots of pages of Japanese instructions. I can see Google Translate coming out for this. Let's have a close look at the piston. The finish looks nice, and the one thing that stands out is how flat the top is in comparison to the Kitako one, which has a slight depression. That could make a bit more compression. Cam wise, it looks pretty similar. No decompression lobes, but we didn't transfer them onto the Kitako cam either, and that starts without any problems. Barrel external finish looks a bit rougher, and maybe a duller finish. And of course, the Takagawa one doesn't have the all takeoff banjos, which I think look great on the Kitako, but we didn't use them anyway, so it's not a big loss. Weight wise, the Kitako is 1097 grams, while the Takagawa is 978. So it's 119 grams lighter, and that's without the all takeoff banjos, which were just about 23 grams. Right, let's get to checking the ring gaps. Now, as you know, there's a formula for calculating piston ring gaps, and that's based on the size of the bore and whether it's a naturally aspirated engine, a turbo engine, what it's going to be used for, basically how much stress and how hot the engine going to get. The hotter it's going to get, the bigger the piston gap needs to be to allow for that thermal expansion. 53.8 millimetres, which is 2.118 inches. And the formula for the top ring, minimum is bore size times 0 0.0045, which gives us nine and a half thousandths of an inch. Then the maximum gap is bore size times 0 0.005, which gives us a ten and a half thousandths of an inch. Second ring is slightly bigger, and that's a minimum of bore size times 0 0.005, which we already know is ten and a half thousandths of an inch, to a maximum of bore size times 0 0.0055, which gets us to just over eleven and a half thou. We'll go for bang in the middle. Top ring, ten thou. Second ring, eleven thou. Now. If you've watched the Kitako build vid, you'll know you've seen us use a ring grinder to increase the gap ever so slightly to get it to spec. So it'll be interesting to see if we need to use that on this kit again. So out of the box, we have five rings in total. The top ring, the second ring, two all scraper rings, and a corrugated all ring. The instructions highlight the fact that both the top and second rings have markings facing upwards when installed correctly and that the top ring has a silver edging to it. It's quite noticeable when you shine a light. Once you've identified each ring, it's time to seat them inside the barrel and measure the ring gap. To do this, just push them into the barrel and use the piston to push them in and make sure they're sitting perfectly square. Once in position, use a feeler gauge to check the gap. Now, we expected them to be tight like the Kitako kit, so with a target of 10, we started at 9. It went in, no bother. Then a 10, no bother. A 12, still goes in, no problem. A 14, a 16, it was starting to drag on the feeler gauge just at 16. So obviously, right out of the box, the over the top spec. We repeated the process for the second ring and it's exactly the same. That one being around 16 and a half thousandths of an inch. We contacted Takagawa Japan and they said that the ring gaps we'd measured were just within the allowable tolerance for their kit. I guess we'll see on the dyno. Fundamentally, the ring seals in the combustion and an oversized ring gap can allow combustion to pass by the piston, which reduces the power made. Now, in reality, it's a very small gap. So we decided to continue and we'll send it to the dyno and let the results speak for themselves. Let's get the rings onto the piston. Now, this isn't a how-to on getting the rings on, 
but let us know if that's something you want to see close up. In a nutshell, you put an all scraper ring on first into the bottom groove, followed by the corrugated ring in the same groove, with the second all scraper ring into that same groove, so all three all rings in the bottom groove. Don't worry about the orientation at the moment, we'll sort that out later. Then work the second ring down to the second groove. Then the top ring, the silver one, into the top groove. Now they're all on, spin them round to the ring gaps are evenly spaced. The instructions in the kit have a decent diagram showing where they need to be, 120 degrees apart from each other. Now before you start assembling the parts, make sure you give everything a good coating of engine oil. Work it into the rings, coat the inside of the barrel, then insert the piston just enough to cover the rings, making sure you have enough access to slide the wrist pin. And note, the markings are different on the pistons. The Takagawa one has the intake identified with an IN, which is the same as the OEM, whereas the Kitako one has the exhaust outlet identified with an EX, so don't get these confused. The Takagawa one needs to go in the barrel with the IN pointing up the same as the OEM. Give the gasket surfaces a little clean to make sure there's no oil interfering with the mating surfaces and you're ready to fit it to the engine. Before we do that, we need to check that the barrel and the head studs are tight. They have a tendency to undo themselves when you're loosening the head stud nuts. Now, these need a couple of seven millimeter nuts. Wind them on, lock them together against each other and use a torque wrench to tighten to 7.5 Newton meters. And as you can see, some of them are quite loose. With those re-tightened, we need to add a small smear of liquid gasket to the casing joints at the top and the bottom of the casing. It doesn't need to be a lot, just to smooth out any imperfections in the joint. We used Abro 999. It's good for up to 343 degrees C, so I think we're safe there. Make sure the two metal dowels are in place over the stud bolts and slide the gasket into place. Then, offer the barrel with the piston down to the connecting rod. Push the wrist pin in and secure either side with the supplied retaining clips. Reinsert the cam chain guide wheel and hand tighten the bolt and then reinsert the cam chain guide itself. Head gasket on next, check the alignment dowels are in place and slide the head down into position. Reinsert the head flange bolts and the four head nuts and washers. Make sure you put a drop of lubrication on the head nut threads so you get the proper torque when tightening them up. Tighten them in a diagonal pattern and torque them evenly to 18 Newton meters. Then tighten the flange bolts to 10 Newton meters. Set the crank to top dead centre. You can check out our other videos if you want to see how to do this. Insert the new cam, make sure you give it a good oiling up before doing so, then tighten the cam retaining bolt to 10 Newton meters. And at this point, tighten the cam chain guide wheel bolt again 10 Newton meters. Reinstate the cam gear, ensuring the tab goes into the keyway. The crank hasn't moved off top dead centre and a small circle on the cam gear lines up with the mark on the head casing. Reinsert the cam gear retaining bolt and tighten that up to 27 Newton meters. Refit the cam gear cover and torque that to 9 Newton meters. Refit the stator cover, torque to 10 Newton meters, refit the timing sensor guard and the connector. Now it's time to set the intake and exhaust valve clearances. These are different to stock and different to the Kitako kit. Both the intake and the exhaust are set to the same clearance of 0.08 millimeters plus or minus 0.02 mil. The OEM and the Kitako exhaust valve clearance is much bigger, 0.2 millimeters, but the Takagawa one runs a much tighter exhaust tolerance. So again, Using the Kitako valve tool, set them accordingly and we'll make a separate video on just checking and adjusting valve clearances. Torque them up to 9 Newton meters, pop the valve covers back on. 
Next, it's a throttle body. Reinsert the gasket, lower it back down into place, and use a flange bolt to secure the 12 Newton meters. Then, depending on your setup, refit the airbox, air intake, oil cooler, exhaust header, etc. Throw some new oil in, and as always, we'll be using standard Honda 1040. I'll put a link in the description for the little 3D printed screw in oil funnel. It makes life a lot easier. Right, moment of truth. Battles cast out of, or something in the actual thickness of the wall. What a difference! No, no, it just shows you. Although nothing wrong performance-wise, mechanically runs great. The Kataco ones just rattling. And there was no massive differences in visuals and handling them that would determine the noise one little bit. Well, I think we'll call that a success. With the Takagawa 145 big bore kit, we've definitely lost that metallic rattle. And we'll play a clip of each now. And although it's always harder to get a true sound on video, I still think you can tell. And in real life, wow, what a difference. The noise the Kitako kit made has totally disappeared. the fact the noise has gone, a positive for us to take from the Takagawa that the piston design, totally flat versus recess shape in the Kitako, we'd expect it to make more compression and therefore more power. However, a couple of things to look out for. The Takagawa kit, it doesn't come with the 7mm locking nuts to retighten the barrel studs and if we hadn't kept them from the Kitako kit, they'd have been a bit stuck. So if this is the first big bore kit you're doing, Get yourself a couple of 7mm nuts which aren't as easy to find as you might think. The Takakawa hit didn't come with replacement dowels. Luckily we kept them from the OEM ones from the original bike and we reused them. And the big E, well that might just be those oversized ring gaps. We were looking for 10 thousandths of an inch and it was 16 for the top. And we were looking for 11 for the second ring and that was just over 16. Now that could lead to some compression loss which we'll see on the dyno. So Make sure you subscribe and you won't miss that dyno run. Hopefully you'll see it make a bit more power than the Kitako and sounding great. Until then, it's all from Small Bar and More. Catch you on the next one.